1927, at the 5th Solvay Conference on Physics in Brussels, Belgium, a new proposal of mind over matter was admitted to try to resolve inexplicable behaviors on quantum mechanics. With the greatest minds in physics attending, such as Einstein, Pauli, Dirac, Bohr, Heisenberg, Curry, de Broglie, Schrodinger, just to name a few, the subject of consciousness and the atomic world was at hand. Heisenberg and Bohr approached Einstein with a new theory that the minds of the researchers were affecting the results of the experiments. The mathematics of predictability were not repeatable and reliable enough to explain what was happening. Einstein could not accept this at first because it violated all mathematical models. Years later, he admitted it was happening. Einstein said, Anyone who becomes seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that there is a spirit manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. A spirit is not a mechanical force like gravity, electromagnetism, or the strong and the weak forces. A spirit is consciousness. So for Einstein to have made this great transformation can only mean that something convinced him that it was really happening, that the universe is alive and we are part of it. Did great powers hide the truth about what was discovered at the conference because they knew they could not control us if we knew the secret powers of our minds and collective consciousness. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force is the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Max Planck, the father of quantum physics. The secret of mind over matter was known 18 years before the first atomic blast at Trinity Site, New Mexico, July 22, 1945. Our current science cannot handle consciousness. Although some people like to say quantum physics can explain consciousness, the fact of the matter is that uh, physics cannot deal with an experiment where a human being is involved in the loop. Uh, this goes back to the way quantum physics was originally built back in the 19 uh, teens and 20s and 30s. Uh, whenever there's a conscious observer present, he causes a collapse of the wave function. Now the wave function is a mathematical construct that describes the waviness of probabilities of events at the quantum level. And quantum physics is a set of equations that describe how this wave function behaves. When an observer looks at an experiment, he causes a collapse of this wave function. He destroys information. It basically starts the wave function from zero and things have to start up again. So an observer right now has a chaotic effect in trying, in trying to in describe or explain uh, what goes on when a person is in the loop. Current, our physics right now is incomplete. We cannot deal with a consciousness affecting other physical objects in an experiment. We just don't know how to deal with it. So uh, what you find is that most uh, physics experiments keep observers out of the loop. They'll put a scientist outside the box. He gets to look in maybe at the end to see what the results were. But because his uh, consciousness collapses the wave function, they don't let him in. It's like a bull in a china shop. He messes up their predictions, and they don't know how to deal with it. We, we live in a world today uh, where there's a hierarchy of power. There are very powerful people, and there are very uh, there are people with virtually no power at all. What's very important from a biological understanding is every human being is equally powerful in their creative ability to shape the planet. And then you say, well, if everybody is equally powerful, then how did other people would gain so much more power. And here's the joke. They didn't gain any power. The reason they became more powerful is they took away the power from us. 
and that the evolution that we're experiencing right now is to recover that power because when the entire population is possessing such power there's more of a likely better resolution and harmony than a world today where only few people are exercising that power and I really look forward to that evolution when we recover the power we've always had which means going back and reprogramming our belief systems to own how powerful we are. Human intention can significantly influence the properties of materials and the nature of reality. As early as 1957, Professor Hans Eisenseg, then chairman of the psychology department at the University of London, wrote a letter insinuating that there was a gigantic conspiracy involving some 30 major universities all over the world and hundreds of highly respected scientists to silence the truth about what we knew about the powers of human consciousness. After the United States Congress had access to the data from the Stanford Research Institute and from universities all over the country and all over the world, they were terrified of what would happen if we all developed the powers of our minds. It was clear that we could remote view, we could see into the future, into the past, we could find you know, missing airplanes and, and, and anything you can imagine with our minds. And they actually did a smear campaign with the media to discredit what they had discovered because they didn't want us to know how powerful our minds really are. What is the language of quantum communication? How does the universe communicate from subatomic particles, wavelets, superstrings, atoms, planets, to stars, galaxies, and all living beings? Is there a communicative symphony happening all the time that remains invisible to our current technology and awareness? What if we understood its secret? Oh my God, we would know how to talk to the Creator, nature, science, and each other, and interstellar civilizations. Are we in communication before we meet in person? How do we as human beings communicate with each other? How do we find our true love, life partners, our soul matches, our families, business partners, our careers, teachers, and life purpose? And how do we find God? Hey, what's going on? I'm leaving you a message. I'm really starting to get worried that you haven't called me back. And I guess, you know, you're not leaving me much of a choice. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I've been needing to tell you via voicemail, even though it makes me very uncomfortable to do that. Yeah, heart disease, uh, the body is not a separate entity, all its different parts just acting alone. There's a, a mind-body interaction that has a lot to do with the development of disease in general. I just wanted to let you know that I can barely, barely, barely live without you. I was paralyzed a couple of days ago and I, I don't know, you know, I've never really had the, the courage to tell you that you're the one for me and I can't live without you. You know, stress on the brain will cause uh, output of energy into the body that uh, affects all your organs. It seems that some people have the propensity to discharge brain stress into various parts of their body. And certain people channel their distress into usually one place. It's really ironic. Some people get back pain from stress. Some people get chest pains from stress. Some people get ulcers from stress. Some people get back, uh, 
upper neck and uh, uh, headaches from stress. This is all uh, channeled energy and distress from the brain going to various parts of the body and uh, manifesting as physical findings and signs from uh, essentially brain stress being channeled elsewhere because the brain I think has only a certain capacity to hold on to nervous energy then it has to discharge it into the body so there's definite mind-body connection uh, a lot of people channel their stress into their heart and uh, we know that stress and adrenaline that's produced by stress uh, goes into the heart and can affect the heart in an adverse way that can create abnormal heart rhythms, uh, spasm of the arteries of the heart, and um, clogging up of the arteries of the heart due to uh, um, adrenaline causing platelets, which are the blood clotting material in the body, to coagulate. Adrenaline does all that, and uh, um, in addition to spasm of the arteries. You see, the heart is an electrical organ. It produces by far the strongest source of bioelectricity in our body, up to 40 to 60 times stronger than the second most powerful source, which is the brain. This electrical energy travels through every single cell in our body and, in a sense, kind of binds the cells together. It's strong enough that it even can be detected outside the body, out into space, beyond the skin. It's not an aura that we're measuring when we do this, or anything like subtle energy. What it is is very measurable electromagnetic energy, much like radio waves. And what we found is that the heart produces an electromagnetic field that surrounds our entire body in 360 degrees. And then it can be detected uh, about three to four feet with magnetometers outside the body. Researchers at the Manager Clinic in Kansas say they've detected it 10 to 12 feet. So regardless of how far it goes, what's interesting is that we produce this electromagnetic field that can be detected. It can be measured with uh, sensitive uh, mainstream medical equipment. The human nervous system is an electrical energy system where positive and negative ions flow. We can even measure the surface electrical activity of the body at the fingertips using a simple voltage meter in the millivolt setting. Most human beings have far less than one volt total, regardless of where we measure along the body. The numbers oscillate due to the numerous electrical pulses in our nervous system. Testing hundreds of individuals, our study has shown that everyone has different voltages at different moments in their lives. Children tend to test around a quarter of a volt, while adults can range anywhere between 0.5 and 30 one hundredths of a volt. If we are less than a one and a half volt battery, how can we broadcast a powerful energy signature? And how can we hear a message that is meant for us? The greatest mind control experiment the government ever did on us is tell us that our minds are not powerful. In the year 2009, I conducted hundreds of voltmeter tests on the human nervous system from age groups from, you know, literally children to teenagers to middle years and to elderly years. I found that all human beings have different millivolt ranges in their nervous system. Our nervous system runs positive and negative ions throughout our body, through our hands and our feet and our chest. Our entire body is being energized by the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. People who have medical conditions such as severe depression or nervous system disorders such as MS have millivolt ranges that go between somewhere around five and maybe nine millivolts. Now to give you a comparison, the average person ranges between 50 or maybe even 30 and 100 millivolts. That's the average person in the average state of consciousness. A millivolt is one one thousandth of a volt. So our body is running between maybe you know 30 and, and 100 millivolts optimally. That's when we're really in our optimal range. If there was a way to raise the human body 
voltage, which is the electricity in our nervous system, to higher levels that super athletes train to get their nervous systems up to two full volts per cell, which is 2,000 millivolts. What will happen to our consciousness? Will it be easier for us to project our thoughts to cooperatively affect our reality? Will it be easier for us to apply a stronger signal to the law of attraction? Think of a radio. You know, you're trying to listen to your favorite song on the radio and you can barely hear it because your radio doesn't have enough power. Well, your body is like a radio transmitter receiver. If you don't have enough energy in your system and you're trying to send thoughts out into the universe to cooperatively affect your reality, to attract your soulmate, to attract a business idea, to become more creative, and you don't have enough power in your nervous system, the chances of you manifesting your reality the way you want it to be are going to be much lower. So you need to increase your energy levels first, which you can do by meditation and you can also do by using you know technologies like we're talking about here. Doing a simple experiment when we get a weak signal on the radio and we place our hands on the antenna, the signal mysteriously improves. This is scientific proof that we are likened to an antenna that receives messages from the beyond. Our future soul match might be trying to broadcast us a message, but if we are not tuned, we will not hear what they are trying to tell us. You either need more power or a more finely tuned radio. Did the ancient stone builders know the secret healing powers of spiritual vibration stone technology? Did they know that stones and crystals could hold memory. At the University of California at Stanford in 1993, scientists were able to store a movie of a hummingbird in three dimensions and a separate movie of the Mona Lisa painting inside of a crystal and get it to stay there. If that sounds impossible to you, this is an ordinary sheet of plastic. It's called a DVD. And all it is is plastic with a mirror, shiny coating on the bottom. A laser bounces through that sheet of plastic, bounces off the mirror coating on the bottom, and sends back the information, a movie, a song, your computer files, whatever you want to store in it, to retrieve it so that you can see pictures, you can hear songs, you can hear voices, and you can see photographs and all of your data files in ordinary plastic. Now I'll give you an example here of what we have. We have, this is stone technology. It's in the same shape as the universe, which is a toroid. It's actually the same shape as the Earth's magnetic field and the same shape as the human eye and the iris. And what we do is we send these stone pendants, which you can wear around your neck and hold in your hands. We send them into a series of five quantum energy generators and we charge them with tachyon energy, which is faster than light energy. And the frequency vibrations of the tree of life and the frequency vibration of the NASA actual sound of the sun. So basically, like little miniature hard drives, we found a way to trap, just like a DVD does, traps a movie or a song. We can trap the healing vibrations of the universe in a stone. Then what we did is we tested people. Hundreds and hundreds of people were tested, wearing the pendant, holding it with the left and the right fingers. And we could clearly find, within seconds, the human body voltage would come to much higher levels. While these amazing stone pendants can raise your vibration, scientifically demonstrated, could this increased energy be applied to broadcasting our thoughts and true intentions, giving us a stronger signal? Super athletes and psychics and healers and telepaths have much higher body voltage than the average person. Dr. William Tiller conducted human voltage studies on human beings who were Qigong masters or healers demonstrating extrasensory abilities. 50 to 100 millivolts is natural if you if you put electrodes on the ear um, which is a norm for the body in, in physiological tests then you're talking about a few millivolts 
But if you're working with a healer, as we did some experiments, uh, copper wall experiments with Elmer, Elmer Green and I did this back in the 70s, um, then the, uh, the healer, you can measure body voltages on the walls, um, and we found that a healer could increase the body voltage on a, on a wall uh, reflected, of course, from the body or, or received by transmission from the body, um, 25 volts, 50 volts, 100 volts, 250 volts. We have been able to get signatures of that size. And basically, I was very interested in that, and I, I created a theoretical model that, that what happens when a healer uh, is projecting healing to someone, that at some place in the body, there is a, a, a site where the action occurs to give a, bring about this transmission of energy. And when I looked at more, um, Elmer's data, he had five pieces of experiment, experimental data. He had the voltage on the ear, and he had voltage on four walls, one in front, one behind, one above, one below. So five equations and five unknowns it should solve, and so I solved those equations, and I found that for this particular healer, the source, the primary source, was um, the Dan Tien point, below the, just below the belly button. Is our bio-consciousness likened to a living computer system having its own power supply, memory, feelings, and the ability to transmit information? Well, imagine that you yourself have been designed, evolved, to be the most positively brilliant quantum level computer processor, solution generator, ever, ever evolved, designed, devised on planet Earth. The huge problem is that over the course of us growing up, most of us have taken on a whole series of computer viruses. So imagine that within yourself you might have as many as a hundred major viruses which are clogging the ability to, of that computer to function at its most brilliant levels. And, but on the other hand, imagine if you could learn to clear that processor to the point where it would begin to totally hum in tune with the quantum field at such a level of openness and, and vibratory awareness that it would actually begin to function at the level that it was truly designed to function at. What we found is that the frequencies in that field, the electromagnetic energy and the frequencies that are in the radiation from the heart, actually change depending upon what we are feeling. Our emotional state influences changes in that electromagnetic signature. For instance, if we're feeling a strong negative emotion like anger or frustration, it creates what researchers call an incoherent spectra in that electromagnetic field. Lots of different frequencies fighting for power. The pattern looks very jagged and irregular, kind of like you'd see if you were looking at a pattern of an earthquake. And we see that kind of electromagnetic signature again when people are feeling these negative emotions. The good news is, is that we see a completely different kind of feel when people are feeling positive emotions. You know, really heart-based emotions, emotions that have long been metaphorically associated with heart. For instance, if we're feeling real genuine appreciation or sincere care or real compassion, what we see in that field is what's called a harmonic spectra. The frequencies are now working together. They create what's called a harmonic sequence. They're not fighting for power, they're supporting one another. And all of these changes occur because of what we do as human beings. The emotional qualities that we are bringing to life affect that field. Now you take that a step further. The field surrounds us in 360 degrees. It's brought, we're broadcasting that energy, first of all, to our own bodies, but we're also sending it out into space. So in a sense, we are communicating our emotions through an electromagnetic field produced by the heart. So there's a lot more research to be done on this because now we've moved beyond biology into physics. Now we're into electromagnetic fields. How do these fields affect one another? How do they affect each other? These are all interesting questions that we have ongoing research to come up with definitive answers for. 
And I think it's just the beginning. I think that what we're measuring is some of the densest energy produced by the heart. And that there's another subtle energy component of heart that's far more powerful, far more interesting, and that radiates far beyond just a few feet. And all that will be discovered in the next few years. Of all the energy centers of the body, the heart center produces the strongest signal. With heart disease being the world's number one cause of death, and the heart center being the main broadcast power center of the body, we have to nurture and respect it as if our lives depend on it. If we intend to send out a signal to attract a response, and our central power source is damaged, we will be sending out a weak signal. And the question is, do the magnetic laws of attraction hear a weak signal? While we are living at one location on the earth, and the people we want to meet may be in another, how can we communicate with our future soul matches through the field? Well, the most important thing is doing soul work, meaning putting your soul into the conscious field where your soulmate soul can find yours. And that doesn't have to do with outward things so much as it has to do with accessing your soul. And a lot of us, that can be confusing because we may think our emotions are our soul. But usually our emotions are tied into, you know, past issues and psychological triggers. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about nurturing your soul in some way on a daily basis or bringing it out, finding ways that will trigger it so that it expands outside of your aura and into the conscious field where you would have other souls and that creates a line of communication or a signal so that the other soul when they're when they're in that field as well will recognize you and then ultimately you'll meet physically but um, in order to meet your soul mate we are talking about a spiritual soul bond we're not talking about bonding on a personality level or cultural, social, or um, religious level. It's all about the soul bond. So you need to be doing soul work on a regular basis to bring that intention out there. The field is the soul governing agency of the particle. What he meant by that is the field the invisible forces are the sole governing agency of the particle matter so it says human beings as physical matter are actually governed and shaped by the field and this is what we're beginning to learn reading the field is very important for our survival the human body has an aura of electromagnetic light energy that radiates far beyond the boundaries of our physical body Doing another simple experiment with our radio antenna, we can see that a weak or static radio station comes in more clearly just as our hand comes near the antenna without even touching it. Arizona Senate Democrats please that President Barack Obama will be in Phoenix next week to speak about the economic stimulus plan. Minority Leader Jorge Garcia of Tucson says the emergency funds will hopefully offset spending cuts that the Republican-controlled legislature are imposing to balance the state budget. They will put a lot more money into Arizona's economy. This is simple scientific proof that our field is interacting with the field of the radio waves at a distance. Our consciousness transmits information into the field, but how powerful are our thoughts and feelings? It's important to clear your field so that you are creating a very intentional signal. Um, by that, one of the things is not dating or having flings. Um, not holding on to semi relationships that have your foot in one one foot in and one foot out um, you want to clear all of that because that will actually um, create confusion in the line of communication it'll make it like static um, and it will also bring people around you that can misguide you or you may think that, that they're the ones, but it'll be confusing you because you're sen sending mixed messages. So they may, may be 
partially what you want, but they're not in fact your true soulmate because um, you're sending out mixed messages about what you want. Um, so it's it's vital to clear your space on that level if you're looking for an intimate soulmate relationship. Totally clear that space and make it open and available to actually find the true soulmate that you're looking for. As all seven of our body's energy centers send out living light waves of different frequencies and amplitudes, they are also sending out our personal information. This means our inner spiritual architecture represents a personal signature of our knowledge, experiences, desires, feelings, true intentions, and deepest thoughts. This signature will be met with a response, whether we are conscious of it or not. One of the ways to understand the mystery of attraction, the mystery of what pulls some people together, why one woman will turn a man on and that same woman will not turn another, why one man will just make a woman open up in feelings of love and that same man will be nice to another woman but she doesn't have those same feelings to her. There's an actual dynamic between the different energy centers in the body. If we look at the seven basic energy centers, they're like circuits in the body. And we're not all, as individuals, we're not completely whole in that those, all those circuits are connecting all the time. For example, I just spend time with some people and suddenly I naturally feel smarter. I feel brighter. That's because their circuits are activating a part of my circuitry that makes the energy flow more completely. Often people go to a spiritual teacher and they'll put them on a pedestal because just in the presence of that person, they feel so spiritually more awakened. One of the higher centers starts to open. Well, it's not that that person sitting there would have that effect on everyone, nor does that person necessarily have all their circuits together at all. It's just that they happen to have one or two circuits that are open that complete another person. In a similar way, it's like a man being turned on to a woman over here and another man not being turned on. This woman literally activates some circuitry inside of this man that, that completes his energy center, so now energy is flowing to the sexual center. Can go, there's always been known in the past the muse. The muse would inspire the writer. If he didn't have the muse, that, that little circuitry that allows him to express what's inside of him simply couldn't be connected. So that's what the muse does. So in a variety of situations, our relationships activate certain circuits inside of ourselves that connect up the different energy centers. Generally, when we find someone that we're in love with, someone that we want to share our life with, that's what we often call a soulmate. And that's someone who activates the circuits in our heart. They activate us to the eternalness of love. And so when we interact with this person and we're open, not when we're shut down, but when we're open, we feel this part of us that can love them forever and wants to love them forever. And that's what we often define as a soulmate. They may not be the one that opens our mind or opens our sense of creativity or gives us confidence. They're going to be the one that opens our heart. It could be they can open three levels or two levels or all seven levels. And that's the uniqueness of every relationship. Uh, never look for perfection in a person, but to know that the perfect relationship for us is someone who stimulates in us, when we're feeling centered, they stimulate within us a feeling, a knowing that this is a person I'd like to share my life with. In their presence, I become a better person. The people we meet and the spiritual experiences we attract by coincidences may not actually be coincidences. They may be the results of our personal broadcasting. So when you want to make contact with your soulmate, in the conscious field before actually meeting them in person. Um, it's, it's when you're actually doing your soul work on a daily basis that you want to put those intentions and feelings into the field. What I mean is like during meditation or prayer, you want to put the feeling tone of wanting to meet your soulmate into that space or if you're writing about your inner emotions and desires you want to put that feeling tone there or if you're um, there's a you know just nurturing yourself put the feeling tone of having a soulmate relationship in that space in that soul work space which will go into the conscious field what you don't want to do is put preconceived ideas 
into that space about what your soulmate looks like, who they are, all those things, you know, it has to do with control. And when you're really ready for your soulmate, you're ready to let go of your control because a soulmate is in fact a soul bond. It doesn't have to do with all those outward, you know, conditions or ideas. It has mostly to do with that soul connection. So that's why I say you put the feeling tone in that special space more than anything. As human beings, each one of us is characterized by our own vibrational frequency, which is a reflection of the proteins in uh, creating our biology. The significance is, is that as individuals with individual frequencies, there are some people whose frequencies are more complementary or more matching than other individuals whose frequencies are quite different. The relevance to this is that matching frequencies or complementary frequencies interact with each other and actually, uh, in the terms of physics, interfere with each other. And as two very closely related frequencies come together, their interference patterns result in an enhancement of the field itself, a powering of that field. So this is called constructive interference and allows two individuals that are closely related to communicate across this field. Uh, the most characteristic and easily understood communication is that that it usually occurs between uh, a mother and her child, uh, which are of course very much connected to each other. And in fact, uh, the child has cells from the mother in it because of the developmental processes that occur during fetal development. And more importantly, the mother has stem cells from the, her child in her body as a result of fetal development as well. So that both the mother and the child are actually sharing cells with the same receptor frequencies on them. And as a result, and this is very interesting because mothers will report this, that they will know if something is wrong with their child, no matter where their child is on the planet. That this is a very, very uh, common experience that if a child is hurt, a mother will know this, even if she's on the other side of the planet. This is just a, a, a demonstration of the fact that the communication between individuals can be picked up through this vibrational field and specifically through the receptors of identity on the surfaces of our cells. Well, the significance of that is it doesn't have to be your own child. It's people that you actually complement with out in the field can communicate across these distances. And very interestingly enough, uh, when people come together as couples and they're together long enough, they can actually begin to use this field as communication mechanism without even using words. So it's very funny sometimes to hear a couple that has been together for a very long time communicate with each other with totally incomplete sentences with no subjects or verbs and yet both of them understanding the communication while an outside party has no idea what they're talking about. And that is because we have two levels of communication, the field and via the particle, via the body. So uh, it's interesting that we're now beginning to recognize the fields in uh, effect. And this is very, very critical for both uh, our communal organization as well as our own physiological expression to recognize the power of the vibrations and how they can influence our own biology. Brain waves are indicative of consciousness and consciousness can travel as a wave. These waves can be reduced to numerical values of wave particles, amplitudes, frequencies, spin, codes, and information. Professional numerologists study these numbers and codes. They study the numerical values of the position of the stars and the planets at the time and date of our birth, our birth location, and our name. Is it possible for advanced numerology to determine our relationships and possible future outcomes? Numbers have harmonic and disharmonic relationships just like music does. So you can listen to certain music and you know, my gosh, I don't like it, it jars me, there's too much disharmony. And the same goes for numbers. So let's say somebody has a prevalent amount of three sixes and nines in his or her blueprint and they meet somebody with a lot of fours and eights they're not going to get along as readily as with somebody who also has the creative three, six, and nines in their blueprint. So you can see, and in the same way, there are certain numbers that are magnetically attracted to each other. Those are the numbers four and eight. So they have almost a fateful relationship to each other. So it gets quite complex as we look at the song and the number song of each person and you, you actually create 
two blueprints, put them together, just like a, a musical, you take two melodies or harmonies and you put them together, and what does it create? Does it create something jarring or not? And certainly with people, we can see how their numbers will either work well together, be compatible, or be completely harmonious, just because numbers are a resonance. They describe something that is key to who you are. Your soul energy is a unique signal that is broadcast into a field where your soulmate's soul energy is being broadcast as well. So your, that is where your souls are bonded when you have a soulmate and that's where you're already having a relationship with your soulmate whether you're aware of it or not. And whether you're aware of your soul desires and feelings or if you're not is irrelevant because you're already bonded with your soulmate on that level and the goal is to become aware of yourself on that level so that you can broadcast your soul into the conscious field where your soulmate can do the same and that will trigger and speed up the process of finding your soulmate in a physical plane so that you actually are meeting them and are able to have a relationship on a day-to-day -day basis. Our DNA represents our entire genetic blueprint. It is here that everything about us is represented by letters in the DNA matrix code language. Our destiny appears fixed because of this unshakable blueprint. Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, the discoverer of biophotons in 1976, Prove the origin of these human light emissions are emanating from our DNA, the core reactor from where we are broadcasting our personal energy signature. Dr. Bruce Lipton has made a revolutionary discovery that first proved that the DNA nucleus is not the brain of the cell, rather the intelligence center of the cell is the membrane. The membrane receives signals from our consciousness and writes the DNA code. For the first time in history, Dr. Bruce Lipton is proving that we can actually reprogram our DNA if we are dissatisfied with our blueprint and broadcast a new message about ourselves to the universe. The fact is that the cell membrane of the human cell actually is an information processor. And what I ultimately realized in 1985 was that that processor had a, a very uh, interesting and important definition. The definition of the membrane is it's a liquid crystal semiconductor with gates and channels. When I recognized this biochemical description in 1985, uh, I was very much amused by it because I said I, I've heard that exact same definition somewhere else and actually had to go search for where I heard it or found it. And what I saw was I read it in a book called Understanding Your Microprocessor, a simpleton book about how to use a computer. Basically, the definition, liquid crystal semiconductor with gates and channels, is the exact same definition of a computer chip what this all led to was a very simple and yet very profound understanding. The cell is an information processor because the membrane reads the environment and adjusts the biology. The nucleus of the cell with its genes represents a hard disk and the genes are programs. Our old belief system is that the nucleus and its programs were read-only memory so that whatever the genes are that would be our fate. However, the new insights offered uh, reveal that the nucleus of the cell was not read-only, it was actually read-write. So basically, the cell was a programmable device. You'd put it into an environment, it would read the environment, and then adjust the expression of the genes to match the needs of that environment. So taking genetically identical cells and putting one set into a culture with certain environmental conditions caused the cell to program itself as a muscle cell and a genetically identical cell put in yet another environment, uh, reading the constituents of that environment would lead to the expression of a bone cell. So basically the cells are programmable in response to environmental information. And one last piece just to tie it together for all of us to understand is that if you put a 
culture dish of cells into an adverse environment, then what would happen is that those cells would actually get sick and start to die. And if you take that very same culture dish and move it into a healthy environment, the same cells would immediately recover and start to proliferate and the cultures will flourish. The relevance about all this is that we go back to the nature of a human being and recognize that containing 50 trillion cells, the human body is essentially a skin-covered petri dish. If you take your human petri dish body and put it into an adverse environment, it will cause the cells to get sick and to actually begin to die. And yet if you take that same skin-covered body and put it into a healthy environment, the cells will rapidly recover and begin to flourish again. So the important reality is that our state of health or disease is really a reflection of the environment that we live in and the environment that we perceive. He's like, don't trust me. He goes, I will torment you. And I swear to God, that's what ended up happening. I've been tormented by this, this relationship. In each one of us, there are 46 human chromosomes, among which there are nearly 3 billion base pairs of DNA. That means there are 3 billion strands inside of us to store our personal information. If we can rewrite our own hard drive by reorganizing our thoughts, feelings, and higher consciousness, we can reprogram our own personal blueprint to attain any goal we desire. As our personal energy signature broadcasts this new message, we will discover new people in our coincidence meetings. We will also gain new knowledge to apply towards our own enlightenment, relationships, careers, and life purpose. Scientific studies have shown the heart is not only the most powerful center in the body, it is the most intelligent, having the ability to receive precognition. If we can create a coherence with our minds and heart center, we can access our intuition more frequently. One of the interesting studies that was done here at the Institute of Heart Math with our, our chief researcher, Dr. Roland McCready, was a, re, was a study on intuition and the intuitive response. And in that study, they had um, test subjects that were placed in front of a computer and they were wired up. They, had, they were looking at brain waves, they were looking at galvanic skin response, they were looking at readings from the heart, heart rate variability analysis and things like that. The test subject would push a button and there would be a delay before the picture would appear on the screen of the computer. And the computer was randomly selecting the pictures. No one knew, no one could know what the computer was going to select. Some of the pictures were pleasant and some were horrific. What we found was is that in many cases, the body started responding to the upcoming picture, responding in the way it would normally to the upcoming picture, about six seconds prior to the picture actually showing up on the screen. Six seconds prior, the body began to do what it would do if the picture was there. It was a very, very complicated study, a very uh, detailed study published in two parts in the Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. The data analysis showed something very, very interesting. It showed that when that response began, that the first part of our physiology that was doing sort of the, the intuitive or pre-cognitive response was actually the heart. The heart was responding before the brain. It began to go through a deceleration process that would be compatible with the picture that was going to come up. About a second and a half later, the brain began to do what it does in regards to that picture. But within the human system at the physiological level, measuring that intuitive response to an upcoming event, it was the heart that responded first. And as I read the, the summary of that study, I found it fascinating because what the summary basically said was is that it appears as if an upcoming event is significant or emotional, that we have a tendency to be able to sense that or to respond to it before it actually occurs. And that it, our biology has the capacity and, and does in many ways scan for the future events. It's constantly scanning for future events, but that it's something we're not aware of. We don't know that it's there. We don't know that we do it. But the punchline was is it would be very useful for us to develop that. And it has a lot of utility, a lot of practicality in how we navigate our lives. 
And so it's just one study beginning to decode, you know, something that's remained sort of uh, mystical or sort of you know, vague, which is intuition. What really, what is intuition? And I think certainly there's a lot more to go in that area, but this is one study that indicates that there is a response, that the body itself is actually scanning for future events, and that the first responder to that entire process is not the brain, but in fact it is the heart. We know that our whole biosystem begins to shift in, in terms of what we in sports psychology have re been referring to as being in our zone. So when a person learns to open into that more quantum attuned way of being aware and being present, it's like our, instead of focusing in narrow band, problem focused, fear based ways, where we're looking at some kind of threat and focused entirely on, the, on a problem, and all our internal organs begin to contract, and thus our emotional system begins to go into overreaction. When, when we're feeling and emoting, when we're being within that zone space, our internal organs begin to open up. They begin to relax. Our awareness field, instead of being narrowband focused, starts to broadband focus. And what we've, studies have shown is that in that state, we actually begin to process way more bits of information per moment. And we're, when we're in that state, we have the experience as though time is slowing down. Because we know from uh, time and motion studies in, in movie projection that when we feed more frames of information per moment through a projector, it creates the illusion of time slowing down. So this is often what ex people experience when they're in that zone state of more quantum field, present attuned awareness. They start to feel like they're, they can make much more effective decisions in a kind of ongoing, flow-like way. We've all had tastes of what it's like to be in this zone. Those are those magical times when you have a few hours, a few days sometimes, even sometimes a few weeks, where it seems like you just can't do anything wrong. Everything comes up roses. You're in the right place at the right time, the right information comes to you, you start to feel like you're being guided to make the right decision. So this is part of what we're talking about in terms of becoming more quantum level attuned. In 1992, Professor Walter Shemp discovered how atoms communicate with each other over any distance through the field. He discovered in the atom when electrons are in a higher frequency shell or orbit around the proton, the atom emits light waves carrying intelligent information, similar to the way when we are talking and communicating our brain waves go into a higher frequency wave state. He found when the electron jumps to a lower frequency wavelength, the atom receives photons carrying intelligent information as if they are listening, just as when we are listening, we go into a lower frequency brainwave state. The timing of when electrons jump shells to higher or lower frequency orbits is completely random and cannot be quantified by any mathematical predictable formula likened to random human behavior. There are several other behaviors in quantum mechanics that remind physicists of human random consciousness as opposed to models demonstrating repeatable and reliable mathematical timing such as the sun rising every day at the precise expected time and the nine planets orbits around it. In the quantum universe, finding precise timing and repetition of events is very difficult in certain functions of the atom and its components. Niels Bohr and Heisenberg presented to Einstein at the 1927 Fifth Solvay Conference on Quantum Mechanics that the minds of the researchers were affecting the angular momentum of the electron spin around the proton. This was because different data came in when different researchers were conducting the experiments. The data was always random and could not be quantified in a repeatable and reliable mathematical formula. As far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. 
Albert Einstein. In Richard Feynman's book, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter, he tried to quantify the behavior of the timing of which light particles, photons, emanating from a light source would reflect through several layers of glass and bounce back to detectors. Light particles do three things when they strike a glass target. One, they either travel through the glass sheet, or two, they react and scatter inside the glass sheet, or three, they bounce back to give us a picture of the sheet of glass. Feynman shined his light source through several sheets of glass, allowing light particles to choose to bounce off of or react to the surface of various layers of glass. He wanted to see if there was a quantifiable formula for which photons would bounce back and which ones would travel through the glass or penetrate deeper and bounce off another sheet of glass or scatter and react inside of it or deeper yet travel through all the sheets of glass. Regardless of the color of light and various other parameters there was no way to quantify the strange behavior of light and matter. The light particles, photons, always behaved randomly as to what they would choose to do, just as in human consciousness. Could human intention be so powerful that it could tell particles of light, photons, to penetrate through several layers of glass and even solid barriers? PhD psychologist Stanislav Ojak has demonstrated his power of intention over the film plane of a camera. His intention is so powerful he found he can cause a photograph to appear while the lens cap on the camera is blocking the lens and the film plane from receiving light. He has done this hundreds of times. He has also been able to take pictures with film and cause invisible spiritual phenomena to appear. His film and photographs were analyzed by Kodak Film Laboratories to be authentic and not caused by double exposures or trick photography. Several abnormalities that began to occur in the pho photographs. Uh, people became transparent or they disappeared. Uh, light aberrations and then entities which appear to be human-like in some form, but not as we would say it was uh, definitely humanoid. And these aberrations went on. So over a period of about four years, it's 74 to, uh, oh, it's longer than that, 74 to 1981, accumulated, uh, over 5,000 photographs with a 22% anomalous factor in regards to that. As Stanislav O. Jack took a mystical photographs of the 1972 Seals and Crofts concert, a large luminous face appears overlooking the band on stage with Cher. Then what appeared to be a band of divine beings of light pointing and perhaps even dancing to their music gazed into our world without us ever even knowing it. Could beings of light and even angels have listened to the spiritual music of Seals, Croft, and Cher? Could such beings have even inspired their music to be born? We took, he took pictures uh, with the lens cap on the camera so that you, the radiations that eventually were registered on the film um, went right through the lens cap and the lens cap will block electromagnetic radiations. So it definitely was a, uh, different radiations than electromagnetism and that's why I've called these things subtle energies. They're quite, it doesn't mean they're weak, it means they're subtle in the sense that they're very different from the energies associated with the four fundamental forces that we know from orthodox science. Dr. Claude Swanson's synchronized universe model may help explain how we can see 
into the invisible dimensions of the universe and explain visions and apparitions and how we can interact with those dimensions but more importantly to prove that they are part of our reality. I developed what I call the synchronized universe model as a way of trying to expand current physics to account for a lot of these psychic phenomena, paranormal phenomena, uh, besides the types of things we've been talking about which involve communication psychically uh, and affecting things at a distance, you also have other abilities that the yogis have demonstrated, that certain adepts in China, the Qigong masters have demonstrated, things like walking through walls, levitation, teleportation, things that in the West we laugh at and we call them science fiction, and yet there are people who have demonstrated uh, reliable abilities to, to, de to produce these effects. So our science needs to be able to account for how this is possible. And the synchronized universe model uh, says basically that matter is not what we thought it was. They're not like little billiard balls or even little quantum points moving around that when we say there's a particle at some place, it's a solid matter, what that really involves is an energy exchange between that charge or that particle and all the other particles in the universe. The things are moving very rapidly on a very small scale. This is a scale smaller than the size of the electron, down to more of the Planck scale, which is the, the basic smallest scale that physics tries to describe. At that scale, there's a synchronization that has to happen, uh, that particles only see each other uh, when their velocities are lined up with each other. In other words, uh, at a very small scale, all the particles are moving very rapidly at the speed of light. So in this system, at a very small scale, uh, and this is part of uh, what we have special relativity, part of our current physics, uh, at very high speeds, a particle only can kind of look in the direction that it's traveling. So if it emits a photon, it has to be in the direction that it's traveling at that instant. Uh, off in the distance would be some other particle. Uh, if they're going to interact mutually back and forth, that particle also has to have a velocity lined up with the first one. So the primary interactions at this very small scale would involve particles with velocities that are aligned at that moment of interaction. A moment later, their velocities have changed because they received an impulse from one another. And what this leads to is the only stable uh, uh, solution of this system is when the particles end up being synchronized with each other. The ones that interact consistently on the average over time are the ones that are to take on little orbits at very small scale down to Planck level, um, which are synchronized. You could have many, many other systems of particles that have some other synchronization, either a different frequency of oscillation or a different phase, so they're in some other part of their orbit, so they're looking in a different direction. Those particles would not, on the average, see the first set of particles. So they would be invisible to us or we might, might, might see them occasionally as quantum noise, and that, that may well be the origin of quantum noise. So you end up with a, a system which you can think of like a, a stack of sheets of paper, and one sheet of paper is like our physical universe. The particles that on that sheet of paper are the ones that are synchronized with each other. We call that physical reality. That's what our current physics tries to explain. That's where our laws are applicable. But you can have many, many other sheets of paper with these other parallel systems that are synchronized a little bit differently. Now, what raising the gauge and paranormal phenomena and torsion and these other uh, you know, uh, forces that I've been talking about, uh, what they do is they shift our little sheet of paper. So now we start to move down and dip down and interact with other parallel systems. And that's what, that's what happens when you can start now to, instead of being limited to a four-dimensional reality, your dimensionality now can be five, six, or seven dimensions as you interact with other parallel systems. When that happens, strange things become possible that were not possible before. According to the synchronized universe model, when our own frequency synchronizes with a parallel universe or dimension, it allows us to perceive it in the form of a vision powers of levitation, miracles, knowledge, enlightenment, and even healing. 
Our bodies are made of atoms and subatomic particles. 99.9% .9 of our body weight is comprised of protons and neutrons, which are then made of hexagons of six quarks, each made of dual pairs. Among the quarks are the mysterious strange and anti-strange quark. They are called strange because they have the ability to randomly just disappear from the core of the atom and then strangely reappear. There is no mathematical model to quantify the timing of when and why they will do this. Is there a connection to the behavior of the strange quark and human consciousness? Knowing that we are also made of a significant percentage of strange quarks, that portion of us is dematerializing and rematerializing at random all of the time. No one has been able to determine where the strange quarks travel to other than the fact that they disappear into other dimensions and reappear. Do they travel to other dimensions to gain information or to communicate at a distance? This behavior demonstrates that part of our consciousness does travel into other dimensions. Can this help explain communication at a distance and mental telepathy? In the 1970s, President Carter, the CIA, and the Air Force used two psychics trained in remote viewing to locate a lost Russian Tu-22 bomber, which no other forces could find. The remote viewers gave blind latitude-longitude coordinates that led Air Force officials to point their satellite cameras deep into the jungles of Africa, precisely where the Russian Tu-22 had crashed. The, the significance of the case where Carter talks about how remote viewers were used to find the missing bomber that had gone down in the jungle shows that remote viewing can be very accurate and can be useful. Uh, now his comments about the case were a little bit of an oversimplification. There was more than one remote viewer actually involved. They do it several times to check one another. But the fact is that remote viewing, uh, number one, can be very accurate. And number two, uh, you know, was really used uh, for important cases over an extended period of time. And even though they claim that it's finished and there's no more remote viewing going on, that's what they said before they admitted that this program was there too. So you can, you know, you can make your own conclusions about that. The point is that consciousness really can be used to give us information that might otherwise be unobtainable. Later, in 1979, Congressman Charles Rose, then chairman of the House Subcommittee on Intelligence Evaluation, reviewed the U.S. government's secret psychic spy program. He then warned that if the Russians had this ability and we didn't pursue it further, we would be in serious trouble. Well, there's certainly plenty of evidence uh, of that the out-of-body programs were going on, the remote viewing programs were going on. Um, what has been made public is the 20-year remote viewing program that um, was started by the CIA in the 70s that um, physicist Hal Putoff and a couple of the people started. Um, and they found out from their early experiments they could go into laboratories in Russia uh, one of the first laboratories was at Semipalatinsk, which uh, they, the, the CIA at that time had been unable to look into. They saw a building, uh, large, large structures, uh, a lot of activity, but they could not tell what it was being used for. Um, and so one of the first successes that started the program was when a man named Pat Price remote viewed the inside of the facility. He saw uh, overhead cranes. He saw overhead cranes moving along overhead outside of the building that had railroad tracks on each side of the building. He saw these huge steel spheres that were being cut with special types of welding techniques. They were foot thick steel sections of spheres. We had no way of, at that time of welding such large structures, but they developed a technique to do so. And he didn't, he, he by using his remote viewing ability, he figured out that these were going to become large underground spheres to capture the energy from explosions. And 
and use that energy to make a beam weapon. This was part of the Russian uh, beam weapon program. And of course, in the 80s, Ronald Reagan started the Star Wars program in an effort to counteract some of this technology. But the first uh, inkling we had that the Russians were involved in this was Pat Price's remote viewing back in 1974 or 75. While the United States Nuclear Weapons Program, peak in evolution, was a 15 megaton nuclear bomb, the Russians were far superior, testing a 50 megaton hydrogen bomb on October 30th, 1961. Was Russian psychic espionage into the United States Secret Weapons Program instrumental in allowing them to gain the advantage? Today, with the Cold War at its end, Russian psychic research is used for mostly peaceful means. Konstantin Korotkov is a professor of physics at St. Petersburg Tech University in Russia. He is the inventor of the world's first camera that can see deep into the human aura's energy field and information band. It is called the GDV. The computer software reads the data the GDV provides on an individual's auric field. It can see breaks in the energy field, early signs of damage to organs, and changes in the field due to higher states of consciousness, the amplitude of energy coming out of all seven energy centers, how well the seven energy centers communicate with each other, and even mental telepathy and healing. So it was really very interesting time because we were able to organize um, a research laboratory, a research center outside of the city in some remote place. We took a house. In this house we put all possible equipment that we were uh, able to think of by the time. And we've been in, uh, selecting and inviting people who was really talented uh, Lavrians and talented psyche people and then we trained them how to operate with each other how to deal with telepathic communications and we've been measuring all this process so um, it was many sessions like this several years it was very interesting results and um, everything we published uh, secret reports on this of course it never been published in uh, any journal, uh, but uh, we have proven that telepathic communication with people is really possible. And it was done on very precise scientific basis. But our approach was different from approach of uh, Russell Tark or uh, some other researchers in the world. We uh, first step was to select specific people to find out people who can do something and who communicate with each other. And uh, I am absolutely sure that uh, really effective communication comes to between people who are really attuned to each other, who have this uh, very, very special entanglement to each other. It may be men, women, it may be men, men, it may be women, women, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not a gender difference. It is a topic of, I would say, spiritual interconnections. And if they have it, then they may be trained how to interact with each other. So from our point of view, when we've done these experiments, and we are doing these experiments up till now, it is very important to select people, to train them and attune to each other. Then it may be effective communication. Do we receive messages from others without even knowing it? Uh, this, was, this was a study to show uh, is it possible to send and quantify measure energy of uh, healing, loving energy, so sending. Uh, as, so if we send loving energy to another being mm -hmm. who is not directly in front of you, mm -hmm but in another space, mm -hmm. will they receive it? Mm -hmm. And if they receive it, how does it show? Wow! That was, the, that was the purpose. And this was done with a team of researchers in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. mm. 
So here we see that uh, you've got the uh, person who is uh, sending energy. This is the right side is sending of energy, mm -hmm. and on this side is the receiving of energy. So from the right side, when you talk about because the emotional heart is on the right, mm -hmm. it is sending. So there is a little burst, and of course these bursts are captured, and it's separate from the body. It's leaving. It's the, this burst is leaving the body. Indeed. Oh, that's amazing. And the receiver is receiving it. And look at the shape of that too. How far away are they physically from each other during these two buildings? Sorry. Two buildings. Two buildings. So this burst of energy traveled two buildings and went to this person who was the receiver. And this and is documented scientifically as biophoton emissions. Yes, yes. If we attempt to send someone we are tuned into a message with our mind, will they hear it? Will they receive it? Protocol where we have instruments on both people, both sender and receiver, and they physically situated in different places, and it may be in different places in Moscow and St. Petersburg, or Moscow to St. Petersburg, or uh, Himalaya to Moscow, Nepal to Moscow, uh, Venezuela to Moscow. So we did a lot of experiments of this kind. In any situation we have time that is correlated to astronomical time, and uh, it's all now possible by uh, GPS uh, to correlate all this. And uh, we were able, uh, and we were measuring a uh, moment of sending emotion, because we are sending not images, not some pictures, not letters, but we are sending emotions. And the aim to detect those emotions on the other end. So we are uh, measuring sending and response from biophysical measurements. And this is electric electrophotonics and uh, balancing platform. So we can really detect the moments of sending and receiving. And in all our experiments we demonstrate that it is no time, sh time shift. Not zero. Zero. Instantaneous zero. action at a distance. Absolute instantaneous effect. As new science builds a strong case for mental telepathy that is faster than the speed of light, how will this instantaneous communication at a distance change our views and knowledge about how powerful each and every one of us really is? That after all our experiments on telepathy, uh, it became clear that in principle you can contact any person in the world if you can attune yourself to this particular person. Uh, and of course it needs some training, it needs some imagination, you should be trained how to do this, but in principle it's not very difficult. And um, I don't like, for example, uh, to make telephone calls. For me it's boring to press buttons and it's busy, line then again and it's again busy. So when I need to contact someone, I just uh, contact this person in uh, mindset and they ask person to call me. And it works very well. So it's people usually call and uh, contact somehow and it works really brilliant. Could a telepathic message be sent from the moon back to Earth? In 1971, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell believed the powers of the human aura and mental telepathy were so profound he conducted an experiment while he was on his way back to Earth from the moon. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell, one of our uh, team of two astronauts who uh, were the last group, I think, to walk on the moon, this was the third group to walk on the moon, um, on his way back decided to do a psychic uh, communication experiment 
He didn't tell his superiors about it, but he'd arranged with uh, several psychics on the ground back here on Earth to try to send them psychic messages about cards. Um, there's a set of cards called the Zener cards, which have patterns on them, and uh, during several intervals on the way back from the moon, he was 200,000 miles or more from the Earth at some of those times, he would send these signals back to psychics on the Earth. When he got back, he compared what he was sending with what they picked up, and the answers that they had received were accurate enough, they were well above chance, and they were showing that ESP was working even over those large distances. So at our present time, uh, it appears as though that we don't know of any limits in terms of distance or time for psychic communication. Subtle energies all go faster than light. Now, when you, I'll ask you to visualize uh, a, a reaction equation, as if you've got a blackboard in front of you, and I'll write mass with arrows back and forth to energy. That is basically what we've done for the last 400 years in orthodox science. And the connection link is Einstein's E equals MC squared. Well, now we want to add, we want to expand traditional science to include human consciousness. Our experiments show that works now in this world we live in. But we don't all agree what consciousness is. So let's not ask what consciousness is, let's ask what consciousness does. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell found that consciousness has a better quality signal in space. Scientific studies seem to confirm that consciousness travels instantaneously over any distance. At least it appears that way over the known Earth to Sun maximum distances measured thus far. Dr. William Tiller calculates that due to the fact that consciousness cannot be blocked by any barrier, including lead and mountains of rock, which are capable of blocking the highest frequency gamma rays. Consciousness must be of a higher frequency than the gamma ray spectrum to allow it to penetrate these barriers. Also, in order for consciousness to appear to travel instantaneously over Earth to Sun distances, it would have to at least travel at the speed of light squared, which is 34.7 billion miles per second. Oh, the theory uh, is that they all travel faster than the velocity of light, and that's why they're non-observable. And the magnetoelectric energy, its, its top velocity, from my theory, is that it's c squared. So it goes from c to c squared. Dr. Tiller's new model of consciousness has multi-dimensions. It starts with the second chakra being capable of sending consciousness as coherent information at a frequency beyond the gamma ray spectrum in the magnetoelectric spectrum with wavelengths so tiny and frequencies so high they could penetrate any subatomic barrier. This level of consciousness can send coherent information at the speed of light squared, or 34.7 billion miles per second. Since the Sun is approximately 93 million miles from Earth, consciousness would appear to travel from the Sun to the Earth in a tiny fraction of a second, 1 373rd. Uh, whereas if you go to the next level, the emotion domain level, it's sort of C squared to C cubed. Dr. Tiller's second level of consciousness emanating from the heart center allows coherent information to travel at the speed of light cubed or 64.64 quadrillion miles per second. This is a level of cosmic proportions. As the speed of light travels 5.87 trillion miles per year and the Pleiades star system is 440 light years away from Earth, or 2.58 quadrillion miles. It would take ordinary light, or radio messages, 440 years to get there. But consciousness, at this level of realization, traveling 64.64 quadrillion miles per second, 
could travel the 2.58 quadrillion miles to the Pleiades star system in one quarter of a second. If we go to the mind level, it's C cubed to C to the fourth. Dr. Tiller's next level of consciousness, emanating from the crown chakra and higher, allows coherent information to travel to the Andromeda galaxy 2.5 million light years from Earth in a fraction of a second. At this level of realization, we attain ultra cosmic consciousness. This means at these higher levels of realization, we can create a dialogue with other galaxies. The answer to how we can attain coherency total perfect harmonic consciousness in each of our energy centers is inside of our biology. Very interesting fact in biology is that no two human beings are the same. And I can say that from a biological expression in regard to a simple observation. If you take cells or organs out of your body and put them into anybody else's body, those cells and organs will be rejected by that individual uh, because their immune system will recognize it as not self. So basically it says each one of us has a self. And what was very interesting in understanding the nature of the cell's nervous system, the relationship of the membrane to the cell, was that on the surface of our cells are groups of antennas or receptors. A group of them, uh, are specifically studied by medicine, are referred to as self-receptors. And to me that's a very profound uh, uh, title for these particular receptors, self-receptors, receivers of self. So why this is relevant is that these receptors that receive an identity are on the outer surface of the cell. The relevance to that is that whatever the self signal is, it is out in the environment and picked up by these receptors. Significance to my perception in this is that our identities are not within our biology. Our identities are part of a field and that our biology downloads this information from the field. So the significance is, is that when we talk about our personal identity, we can talk about that identity isolated and localized with our physical body, but we could also talk about the same information or identity that is present in the field. So for example, Cleve Baxter did some wonderful experiments where he took cells from an individual, put them in a culture dish, and separated those cells from that individual by a distance of 40 or more miles. And what he had was an experiment where he put electrical devices to read the electrical activity of the cells in the culture dish. At the same time, he was reading the electrical activity, for example, the EEG activity uh, of, the, of the donor of those cells uh, who was 40 miles away. What he recognized is that if the individual had an emotional experience at that moment, the individual cells would also have an identical kind of activity occur instantaneously at the same time, even though they were 40 miles away. The relevance about this is really very supportive of the fact that the identity is not localized within the body. The identity is part of the field and spread all over the surface of the planet. Significance is this, is that then two people have two physical bodies and they can interact, but they also have two environmental identifications, meaning some kind of energy in the field that is unique to them. Since the field is all entangled and integrated with each other all over the world, that means people are never really separated from each other by physical distances in regard to their personal identity, even though their bodies may be separated. So basically, the nature of people communicating with each other is to recognize that individual identities as vibrational frequencies in a field can interact with each other, especially if there's something called harmonic resonance, meaning the two frequencies share wavelengths together so that when they come together, they vibrate together. And this is how people can actually feel other people that are closely related to them because they can pick up the vibration of the other individual in that there's a complementarity between them and the person they're communicating with. So the significance is we have an opportunity to interact on a non-physical plane through the identity that is in the field. And this uh, is very important because it is not localized to space or time that people can communicate over vast differences on this planet uh, at exactly the same moment of time.
uh, in our current science, there are four basic forces, electromagnetism, gravity, and the strong and the weak forces which occur in the nucleus, and they hold the nucleus of atoms together. And, you know, in our, in our physics research, we've been learning how to unify these forces to some extent, and there's now a standard model that has a way of putting together three of them uh, to some extent. But um, in current physics, there's an attitude that this pretty much explains everything you need to know in the universe. Uh, unfortunately, that idea is based on the fact that our knowledge of physics comes from high energy particle experiments. Scientists take elementary particles and bang them together at high speed and they watch what happens and they say, well, that's the universe, okay? That's what we have to explain. And our current model does a pretty good job of explaining that. What they've overlooked are a lot of other phenomena that they don't tend to study. And uh, if you take the example I mentioned of, of, of ESP or psychic uh, connections, uh, that's one area which says that there are forces and ways of interacting that can't be explained by that four force model. When scientists measure the capabilities of subtle energy or the psychic force, it outperforms all of the other forces. Today, we store and transmit information through radio and television waves. This kind of information is likened to human consciousness, but it doesn't possess all of its qualities. Consciousness is still unique and more powerful. Radio waves and microwaves are used to broadcast voices and television pictures at the speed of light. The problem is these electromagnetic signals get weaker over distance and can distort or collapse when trying to move through solid barriers such as walls, metal, or even mountains. After conducting hundreds of tests, scientists have discovered that subtle energy, the psychic force, is capable of penetrating any dimension, barrier, or distance with no loss in signal quality, even through vast distances in space. The Princeton Pear Lab uh, experiments have also shown that people's minds have the ability to affect things at a distance. They take a device called a random event generator, which makes a sequence of random ones and zeros or yeses and nos based on a quantum circuit. What they have shown is that the mind can affect how that object behaves, what the stream of ones and zeros looks like. And it does not depend how far away you are from the person influencing the experiment. Even thousands of miles away, a person is able to affect the results just as well. So we have an ability to exert a force on distant objects that does not fall into uh, any of the known category of forces. This new force uh, goes through barriers that would normally stop the known forces. Uh, it even acts backwards in time in certain types of experiments. This new force, uh, the Russians have called torsion, is known by a variety of different names. It may be the same thing as what the Chinese call qi, the essence of Chinese medicine. It appears to affect space and time, and by doing so, it affects all the other forces, and it really calls for a new re-examination of physics. Uh, Bill Tiller has called this raising the gauge. Dr. William Tiller has conducted hundreds of tests proving that human consciousness or intention can affect the pH value of water over any distance and through any barrier or dimension. Well, let's start with the unstated assumption that's been existing in science for 400 years since the days of Descartes. And that is that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And so in 97, I set out to seriously test that assumption, uh, having received some important funding 
from a private source. And so the idea was to design uh, four target experiments, set them up with all the kinds of controls you would have in any normal uh, orthodox science experiment, and to then introduce consciousness into the experimental medium. Uh, the four experiments were to, the intention was to increase the pH of water by one full pH unit with no chemical additions. Um, and the uh, water was in equilibrium with air. The second target experiment was to decrease the pH of the same water by one pH unit with no chemical additions, and again in equilibrium with air. And in both cases, the, the accuracy of the measurement instruments were plus or minus 0 0.01 pH units. So we were asking for a signature, which was the order of 100 times the noise. First, Dr. Tiller did experiments applying direct human intention to water and got positive results. He then was able to capture a human intention as if in a computer hard drive in a bioelectrical intention host device with the instructions to raise or lower the pH value in water. Regardless of distance, repeatedly, the intention was able to affect the pH value in water. Within three weeks, the pH had gone up one pH unit, and then Three months later, the Milan folks weighed in, and we said the same thing to them to be part of the experiment. We wanted them to just measure background, um, and we used it as a control site for, again, the three active sites. And within one week, the pH went up 1.7 pH units. And we looked at our data. We found in one of the control sites in Missouri, it was underground, and there the pH had gone up 1.7 pH units. So what we gathered, not only was there information entanglement over as much as 6,000 miles, but that if the measurement site was below ground, the pH went up more than one pH unit. If it was three stories up in the air, as it was in Bethesda and Baltimore, it only went up 0 0.8 pH units. But if it was at ground level, it went up one pH unit, which was the level where we first made the imprint intention into the devices. Another amazing quality the psychic force exhibits is no distortion between sender and receiver. That means the lines of communication remain private. Well, I'm Gary Schwartz, and I'm currently a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona, where I direct a laboratory for advances in consciousness and health and I direct a team of people doing research that essentially integrates body, mind and spirit. I've been doing a lot of research in the area of energy healing and consciousness that involves energy and also extends beyond us so where one person's consciousness and energy can affect the physiology, biochemistry, cellular function and conscious experience of someone else either locally in a close proximity or even hundreds or thousands of miles away. And that's summarized in my new book, The Energy Healing Experiments. Well, we've done many kinds of experiments to look at both local and non-local or distal effects of intention on healing. One area of research involved was called biophoton imaging, where we literally, using a supercooled camera, it's cooled anywhere from minus 70 to minus 100 degrees centigrade. These cameras were originally designed to look out into deep space to photograph galaxies we cannot see with the naked eye. Well, we began to wonder if we could use these cameras to actually image living systems. So instead of looking out at the space, we're looking at biology. And we began working with plants. And one of the many reasons for working with plants, besides they're fundamental to life and they relate to light and we are very much part of the, connect with the, the plant community. But plants are also very easy to work with because they can sit in the dark for long periods of time. They sit still. And so therefore you can get very good images of the light that the plants emit. 
And what we found is that not only can we measure the light that's coming out of the plants, which you cannot see with the naked eye, but we can measure auras that are actually surrounding the plants. So you can see the light that's going on around the plants. Then we can actually see how the plants interact with light. So for example, if you have two geranium leaves, one next to the other, and you take a long exposure, you can actually see the extension of the light. And it's like lightning grabbing one another and caressing one another. You actually see the light beams um, connecting the two, which again, has never before been seen. Now you can take healers, and healers can, for example, send healing inten intentions to a leaf, or they can be specifically asked to say, can you enable the leaf to glow more? And we can actually show that people who are, who are trained as healers can actually, without touching the leaves, with their intention, send an intention for the, the leaves to spontaneously glow more. And then we can place them in, the, in this completely dark chamber where, the, where these images are obtained and lo and behold discover that the leaves are glowing. Now you take that one step further and you could say, well, what about people from a distance? Could people do this 10 miles away? Could they do this 100 miles away or even 1,000 miles away? And with Lynn McTaggart, who wrote the book The Field and has written a new book called The Intention Experiment, we've been doing long distance experiments where, for example, a group of 400 people in England will together as a group for 10 minutes send an intention to a leaf in Tucson in my laboratory to glow. And we'll have two leaves, um, we'll call them leaf A and B. Each leaf has been injured. It's been, um, little holes have been placed in it, 16 of them in a four by four grid. Because when you injure a leaf, it actually glows more. Because, because when there's injury, there's actually a, a, the healing response involves energy. And then what we do is we have two video cameras, cam recorders, picking up the images of each of the leaves and then sending by the internet to England. Now, someone in the audience flips a coin and it comes out randomly heads or tails and let's say they pick leaf B. At this point, the image from Tucson being sent to London of leaf B is now on the screen. And now 400 people can simultaneously send glowing intentions to the leaf that they see. Meanwhile, my research assistant in Tucson, Mark, he's blind to which leaf has been selected. Okay. After the 10 minutes, Mark is then asked to, to take the leaves and put them into the biophoton imaging system so we can collect these long exposure images of the leaves. And then they're blindly scored uh, before we you know, break the code to find out what happens. And much to my absolute amazement, sure enough, if leaf B was selected from a distant group and they could actually see the leaf, they're able to affect the glowing of that leaf compared to a match control. German physicist Fritz Albert Popp proved the existence of biophotons, that all living organisms, including humans, had auras that transmitted and received intelligent signals. He also found that plants communicate at a distance with one another by their transmissions and receptions of biophotons. This digital photograph of a giant palm tree shows something extraordinary that appeared invisible to the naked eye. A two to three foot wide orb of plasma light. It even has a green plasma membrane, kind of like a giant cell. Are plants in communication with invisible beings of light? Could we be in communication through Einstein's action at a distance with our future soul matches as friends, loves, husbands, wives, teachers, business partners, and spiritual mentors before we meet in person for the first time? Could this communication be happening based on our current thoughts, feelings, patterns, and our personal energy signature. Creating a dialogue with your soulmate before you meet them. 
is very important because a lot of us may feel that maybe our soulmate isn't really out there and so you know in the back of your mind you hope for it but it's not active in in your day-to-day -day life and it's important to put those messages out that you know that is what you're looking for you're not going to settle for anything else when you clear your space and you're totally open to receive your soulmate and when you do your soul work on a daily basis and you put the feeling tone of finding your soulmate in that space all of those things are essential to um, communicating with with your soulmate before you actually meet them you have to believe that your soulmate can hear you because if you don't believe it and you're just saying oh I'm gonna put out this message if you're actually there or not you know I don't know but I'll just say that I'm ready and you know you'll hear me it doesn't work that way you have to truly believe that they can hear you and send a clear message to them in order for the line of communication to meet them instantly because that is a not only a leap of faith but it also creates a clear signal so that nothing no doubts no resistance are interfering with that signal if you have a doubt and interference through that you know not being sure then it won't be an instant message it'll be you know it'll come to a stop sign at some point so it's really important to have faith and true belief that your soulmate can hear you when you're sending out those feeling tones and those messages of I'm ready for you and mirroring that in your actions um, on, in you know your day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Bruce Lipton has made a remarkable discovery by observing how biological cells can be in communication with one another at a distance. There's an interesting understanding in biology about how one can separate proteins uh, in a mixture with, which contains thousands of different proteins. And basically how it works is you take a drop of this mixture of thousands of different proteins, you put it on a surface of a gel. And what you do is run an electric current through this gel surface. And what happens is because each protein has its own unique vibrational frequency and mass to it, each protein responds to the field with its own unique characteristics. So as a result of putting the proteins in a field, it causes the proteins to move in that field. Some proteins move faster than other proteins, so the net result is that the proteins actually begin to sort themselves out on a Petri dish. And ultimately, if you continue doing this, you can identify individual clusters of proteins that share common characteristics because they will move at the same rate of speed on this gel. We apply this to an understanding of humans as protein mechanisms. Each one of us has our own unique identifying frequency to it. Each one of us on the surface of the earth is like a protein on the gel. Interestingly enough, the field forces around us, the invisible forces, influence our movement on the surface. So during our lives, we move across the surface of the planet from one place to another. And ultimately, if we share vibrational frequencies with other people, it's inevitable that at some point, we will ultimately cross paths just as proteins do in what is called chromatography uh, or gel electrophoresis. So basically, it's a very interesting understanding that we will ultimately meet up, if we continue our movements, with people that share our vibrational frequencies and, and there are very exciting opportunities when we do because at that moment when you start to encounter the person that has a complementary frequency to you the harmonic resonance actually empowers your own vibration we call it good vibes and in that regard you can actually identify people that are in some way related to you and your harmonics because if their vibration is similar to you the two of them coming together is called constructive interference which empowers each of the individuals and that empowerment is physically felt as much more energy in your body and we refer to this as as I mentioned as good vibes so that we actually have an, uh, a, a sensory system and awareness of when people that are very similar to us or supportive or complementary to us come into our field. I should also acknowledge that there are other people who actually cancel our energies just as well 
That's called destructive interference, so that when some people come together, they actually lose energy and feel weaker, and we refer to that as bad vibes. So the nature of our communications are, there's a, a vibrational communication that precedes our verbal communication. As we realize we are communicating in the present moment with our future soul matches, business partners, mentors, spiritual teachers, and even God at a distance, we can understand how to co-create our own reality. Once we understand the concept that we are constantly broadcasting our personal energy signature into the field, and we're also receiving messages from the field, we can see how we can focus and actually attract not only our soulmates and soul matches, but our future business partners, and actually creating a future career for ourselves that is more harmonious to who we really are. We can also see how we can use the field to attract our spiritual teachers. We want to find teachers that resonate with where we want to go in our spirituality, regardless of our religion. But also, how we can use the field to create a dialogue with the universe itself. So, whether we're an architect, an astronomer, a biologist, a medical doctor, a musician, an artist, or even a student, by creating this dialogue with the super intelligent levels of the field, and expanding our consciousness into the, ultimately into the nine levels of the cosmos, the nine levels of the angelic and the nine levels of the field, we can get the answers to anything we can imagine. The cure for AIDS, the, the cure for you know, biofuels, the next biofuels, we can find the secrets to nuclear fusion, we can find the secrets to unlimited zero point energy, we can find the secrets to the next song, the next generation of music, all of that information is available to us in this field if we can tap into it. We can even begin to formulate a dialogue to awaken our own inner genius and true potential. One of the ways that we can access entering a more quantum, broader field range of awareness, a more expansive state of awareness, is to begin to encourage ourselves to see things not so much in terms of concepts and ideas, but more in terms of pure energy itself. So that you begin to perceive what is normally, you would label it and you'd say, wow, that's a rose or that's a car or that's a tree. You would just begin to teach yourself, guide yourself into feeling the pure energy of that experience as though you were in a state of innocent wonder. And, that, and so what this does is that it frees your whole cortical field it's like you, just because you detach yourself from looking at the world in terms of ideas doesn't mean you lose that, those ideas. What it does is it helps you to free your informational field up so that now when you encourage yourself to go into really deep states of peaceful, peaceful, quiet, core being relaxation quiet, when you learn to penetrate to the very core essence of the quantum field itself, what you start to feel is an incredible harmonic peacefulness. So we have a meditation which encourages you to enter into that state of pure, unattached to ideas, pure energy awareness, complete, peaceful, brilliant stillness. And as you enter that, what we now know from studies of, of uh, creative genius, that it's often exactly when we're in the most relaxed, most sort of open-minded spaces, that we begin our brain process, because it's now free, it's suddenly like the electrical circuitry is no longer confined to our old thought spaces. So that our cortex can suddenly flash up with something like akin to a super light, 
like the light of our awareness within our awareness field can suddenly flash into our whole brain field in a much more core contextual way and we start to holographically insight instead of think. We start to get picture images. We start to see potential solutions that are way more holographic. For a description of the difference between holographing and thinking, if you were to think of a, a say a round basketball, and if you were to take a one diameter slice of that basketball in, a t in an attempt to understand a whole field of information, what you would end up with is with two polarized opposites. You would have like an either or, or a right or a left position, or a good or a bad position. And you'd have an argument because you've polarized the informational field. And you tend to look at, at that informational field in terms of being somewhere along that band. I'm in the center, I'm on the right, I'm on the left. Whereas when we insight, if you could picture that same ball, guess how many diameters there are inside of a whole field of information? There's an infinite number of diameters that you can put through a whole field. So the difference between thinking and insighting is when you let the core of that circle of information, which is your brain field, you allow the energy to expand in every direction simultaneously from the core to the boundaries. You get an instantaneous flash of insight. You get a hologram. Suddenly you see solutions in terms of a huge, like, wow. And this is exactly how Einstein incited the theory of relativity. It came to him in an instant. It took him two years to try to explain what he saw in that instant through conventional linear sequential logics. So what we're talking about is teaching people, opening people to a new level of awareness in which they begin to support their intelligence field to jump into quantum field holographing as opposed to thinking. If we awaken to the idea that the universe itself is intelligent, could we create a dialogue with it? What is the universal language? How can we learn to listen to the cosmic conversation? Many scientific studies at top universities around the world have confirmed that consciousness can affect the structure of water. Water has been demonstrated to have memory in numerous studies that our thoughts and feelings can be recorded by water. As water is made of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, we can deduct that hydrogen has memory. Our bodies are made of nearly 90% water, trace minerals, and oxygen. Our sun is also made of the same stuff we are made of. 91% hydrogen, helium, trace oxygen, and trace minerals. Hydrogen was created less than a hundred seconds after the Big Bang, the creation of the universe, and established itself as the most abundant element in the entire universe. The massive spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy is hundreds of billions of stars and planets are made mostly of hydrogen. 75% of the visible mass of our galaxy is made of hydrogen. While hydrogen has memory, could our galaxy's spiral arms, the Sun, and the billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy actually hold all of the cosmic memories of its entire history? Could this be where the great Akashic records archiving all of human history are held? What if we could create a dialogue with this enormous memory system? We could know the answer to any question and solve any problem or any limitation. The language that uh, the spiritual people, and spiritual people meaning that uh, the medicine people, the uh, 
the different uh, religious groups within the, tr the Zuni tribe, when they go into a religious uh, uh, communication system, they talk about the origins of who they are talking to. In a lot of cases, especially in the medicine world, is that they're talking about the the star star people and all the other related uh, priests. They call them priesthood. In one, for example, in one section of the the uh, prayer system, there's a specific line or a phrase or a group of uh, within a prayer that talks strictly about the night beings and in the upper world uh, priesthood they call it. That's the only one that is re referenced as a male and female entity and uh, the star, uh, the sky people, the, the night people priesthood and the finish line in that is that they, they only appear instantaneously. That's, uh, that's one, one line in the, the prayer system. There are so many, so many different uh, uh, parts to the prayer system depending on the specialty of that particular medicine group. Is there a language of the universe, a language if uttered with perfection, the secret forces of the universe could be activated. When we examine some of the most ancient languages in the history of the world, such as ancient Hebrew, the Vedas, Aramaic, and the Native American Indian dialect, we find that these prayers were designed to invoke spiritual, healing, and powerful forces of the conscious universe. <laughs> What I mean by that is that this, uh, the, 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 during the night time, the, the uh, night priesthood, including the female, they come and also that I'm talking about uh, the, the priesthood of the universe, they only come and show themselves instantaneously is what that, that passage means when you're doing our prayers. When we, when we communicate them with directly, that is a prayer that they use. The language of the Zuni is a very unique language in that there is no other Indian tribe that has any connection with the Zuni language. The Zuni is a standalone language system uh, it's, it's determined by the people that study the languages and uh, trying to connect it with other Indian tribes, say like the Hopi or the, the existing uh, Pueblo tribes around uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and even clear down to the Azteco Inca tribes that, and the eth ethnologists and the uh, linguists have never found any connection to any of the the Zuni language, so it's a, a standalone system by itself as, as far as the language is concerned. Do all ancient dialects go back to the same source, the sounds of nature and the sounds of the universe itself? Well, Pleiades, uh, what took me some time to understand is that in the prayer system, they, they talk about all the different directions, not only is it the, the internal part of the earth, the different directions, the six directions of the the, the earth um, boundaries, the up and down, the east and west, and north and south, and so on. And in the, uh, when they start talking, uh, giving a prayer to those people that are in the in the upper world, it starts out with what they, the Zunis refer to as the rock roof. And they're referred to as priests or gods. The rock roof, then the next one is uh, the, the moon and the, the sun, the, uh, the big dipper. And as it goes up, then, then it talks about the seven. The seven took me a long time to figure out that was referring to Pleiades. 
Pleiades is having a, got seven star group or whatever it is. And then above that is the, the supernova, the supernova group. And, and depending on the specific functions of the medicine order society, then again it expands into other uh, star systems and also certain uh, parts of the, I mean certain stars in the, or stars or planets in the universe depending on what their specific uh, order is or their or their medicine group is. And those and those are kept pretty well secret among among those societies. In Zuni, even though the medicine orders are the same, the, the species specific groups have their own references and sometimes we don't know what the other society references are. And but so that's, uh, but in, in the case of, of Pleiades, uh, it's very specific. That's incredible. So you're saying the elders could talk to gods or goddesses from different star systems? Yes. The ancient Hebrew name of God is a name that cannot be uttered or heard by the human ear because it has no vowels to move air through it. The name literally cannot be uttered or heard by the human ear unless vowels are introduced to it. The phonetics of the letters YHWH produce a sound so low in frequency it cannot be heard. The sound of the sun was considered by most ancient religions as the most sacred sound of the universe. It is a sound that cannot be heard by the human ear because the human ear only hears between 20 and 20,000 Hertz. The sound of the Sun is much lower in frequency and also much higher in frequency than we can hear. Could the sound of the Sun be part of the universal language system? NASA has recorded the actual sound of the sun in deep space and compressed the inaudible waves so that human ears can hear it. If we listen to the sound, we can hear and feel a deep vibration. The sound of the sun recorded by NASA is precisely as the ancient Hindus had described it in the Vedas thousands of years ago. It is a mantra that can be intoned with human speech as Om. In the 6th century BC, Pythagoras also heard the sound of the sun and described it as a deep resonant hum with higher frequencies blended into it. How did the ancient Hindus know this mantra if it could not be heard by the human ear? Could they have actually peered into the universal consciousness and perceived it? As human language and the language of nature cannot travel faster than the speed of sound as a sound wave. Language as information can travel at the speed of light and beyond by entangling itself on more subtle energies. In the same way that we can send human voices or music on radio waves at the speed of light, we can send our own dialogue, personal energy signature, and information through our own biophoton light emissions at the speed of light. While the speed of light is useful to communicate within the solar system, it cannot take us far beyond it in any reasonable amount of time. In this way, biophoton emissions are limited, while more subtle bioenergies are not. Dr. Taylor's discovery of the psychic force as subtle energies emanating from the human body of consciousness demonstrates how our personal information can travel on subtle energy frequencies 
at the speed of light squared, cubed, and beyond. Okay, in my modeling which I developed uh, from a deep meditative state uh, in the ni early 1970s, uh, the model that eventually appeared to me, which I wrote down in my first psychoenergetic book, which I didn't publish for about 30 years, uh, that was in 1997, and that was Science and Human Transformation, Subtle Energies, Intentionality, and Consciousness. So, in that, I draw a Minkowski diagram with uh, the standard cone kind of thing, but there are several cones where the events occur inside the normal light cone uh, of Minkowski is the coordinates of distance and time. Um, the limitation of the walls on the cone is velocity of light, C. Uh, the next one, the limits, which is, which is the uh, magnetic information wave domain is C squared. The next one, which is the emotion domain, is C cubed. And the next one, at the mind domain, C to the fourth. And beyond that, spirit. So, again, until you can make measurements, uh, we will not be able to check these kinds of things. But they're internally self-consistent with a variety of stuff. And they, they give us a lot of hope and optimism that if we will ever get out of this box that orthodox science is stuck in, then they will have a marvelous, marvelous adventure uh, in learning more about nature. Is the power of meditation so profound that we can expand our consciousness into the cosmos and perceive the actual sound of the sun and the universe? Yeah, one of the fascinating things about psychic phenomena is that they seem to, to travel much faster than light. And a piece of evidence to back that up, and there are actually now several experiments, but the first one that I learned about was by a Russian scientist named Podshibian, uh, probably back in the early, in the 60s, I believe. He was working with acupuncture and measuring the voltages on the acupoints on the acupuncture, as you know, or you know, certain points on the body that uh, the Chinese medicine stipulates have certain electrical properties. What, as Pachibian was measuring the voltages, he saw a curious spike in them and wondered what the cause of the spike was. Later he learned there had been a solar flare uh, at the moment that he saw this voltage spike. What was strange is that the spike occurred 8.3 minutes before we would be able to see that solar flare because light travels you know, at a limited speed. It takes 8.3 minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. But his spikes showed up instantaneously. So this is the first evidence that there's something that travels much faster than light that affects the body and affects the acupuncture system and we can measure it physically. Since then, the Russians have done a lot of work on what they call torsion, which is their version of the same psychic force and uh, they do find there's an element of that that does travel much faster than light so that um, now even telescopes have been devised which can measure this energy and they show that that signal does travel faster than light so this is again you know another revolutionary aspect of physics that you know most western scientists are just ignoring but it's really important our bodies are made of about 90 plus percent water, which is hydrogen, oxygen, and we're also made of minerals and carbon. The sun is made of over 90% hydrogen, trace oxygen, and trace minerals and helium. It's, it's made of almost the same stuff we are. So inversely, if the sun can send us telepathic messages faster than the speed of light, we can send the sun telepathic messages faster than the speed of light. And what that means is, um, every 11 years, according to NASA, we come into solar maximums where solar flares are a potential threat to our planet. If we can learn to pray and talk to the sun as a living being, not as a god, not as the god of creation, but if we can talk to the sun as a living being, can we collectively, with billions of minds together, ask the sun to calm itself to harmonize itself with us.
and not to harm us. Can we do that? Are our collective minds that powerful? If we consider Dr. Tiller's model once again, realizing that consciousness is operating in a domain beyond the gamma ray spectrum, consciousness has the power to create a universe. Considering a short 10 second gamma ray burst from a supernova will release more energy than our sun will in its entire multi-billion year lifetime, consciousness in the magnetoelectric spectrum and beyond is even more powerful than that. If we could access this through coherent awareness, we could become like gods and goddesses. To me, we are all spirits having a physical experience as we ride the river of life together. Our spiritual parents dressed us in these bio-body suits, put us in this playpen that we call a universe in order to grow in coherence, in order to develop our gifts of intentionality, and in order to become what we were intended to become, co-creators with our spiritual parents. And co-creator means to eventually evolve into the place where you could interact with planets and you could co-create planets or stars. So it's, it's in the game as far as I see it. We're not anywhere near mm, the end of physics, the theory of everything. We're just babes crawling across the floor of the universe. We've hardly begun the great adventure. And all of these things are possible. We manipulate this universe. That's why it's here for us. It's our classroom. No other way to become co-creators on this magnificent scale. But that's in our future from this planet's level of activity. We have to move and become coherent at the deeper levels of nature. Using Einstein's equation of converting frequencies into mass energy, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Any frequency into the gamma ray spectrum, the magnetoelectric spectrum and beyond, coupled with matter, has the power to create anything we can imagine, including the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe. The coherence at this level of nature is very good. I mean, we can make, we can make lasers. We can convert the potential of a light bulb from 50 watts to uh, create temperatures 10 times the surface of the sun if you could make all those photons, electromagnetic photons, coherent. But the dimensionality of the higher dimensions, just as this one, okay, if you look at the most coherent aspect for electromagnetic laser is the wavelength of the light you're dealing with. So but now if you go to the next level the, of the vacuum, magnetic information wave level, you've changed the size scale by 10 orders of magnitude. And then to the next level, another 10 orders of magnitude. And the next level, another 10 orders of magnitude. And so to be coherent at those inner levels, really coherent, the energy densities are beyond your imagining. So it isn't just that it goes C, C squared, C cubed, C to the fourth. The size scale goes down and down and down. The wavelength goes up and up and up. And the power, ultimately, is huge. So in principle, all of the things I've talked about appear to be possible. It is information at this level of reality that tells matter what to do. Consciousness at the magnetoelectric spectrum and beyond can also power a spacecraft at the speed of light squared and beyond. Does this give us a new understanding and a new vision of God? When you make the two into one you will become children of Adam and when you say mountain move from here it will move. Jesus the Gospel of Thomas. By tapping into just a small amount of this consciousness, 
Certainly, we could change the weather, and we could talk to the sun to ask it to do anything. Imagine for a moment if, um, if a hurricane was coming in the future. But now, as people, instead of what we're doing with the weather forecasts, which we're, is we're amplifying the fear and we're looking at all the blowing of the winds and all the torment and so on, imagine instead we had millions or billions of people simultaneously engaged in an organized, synchronized, uh, guided imagery over the media of sending loving intentions and calming intentions to a storm or even was redirecting it to a safer environment would we find that the storm was diminished would we find that the storm might be moved well we'll never discover it unless we look for it if we don't ask the questions and we don't try it we'll never know whether it matters or not the key to talking to nature is to know its harmonic language when we examine this photo of ordinary water flash frozen while it was exposed to the sound of the sun we can see it transforms from its ordinary state of disorder into the most perfect sacred geometry is there a purpose to the sun's sound waves broadcasting throughout the solar system is it a sort of language does the sound of the sun bring order to the nine planets Pythagoras discovered that all of the planets were producing a sort of cosmic music he called the music of the spheres when NASA recorded the sounds of Saturn researchers were in awe the sound of Uranus The sound of Jupiter. The sound of the Earth. When we hear the sound of the earth, we can see it sounds deeply similar to the sounds of birds singing. NASA scientists were astounded when they heard the sounds of the earth for the first time because they knew the birds understood the secret language of the universe and the earth itself. They were singing as if in a dialogue with the creation. When Pythagoras had finished his studies, the HeartMath Institute's Global Coherence Initiative uses scientific technology to perceive electromagnetic changes in the Earth's ionosphere that are coherent with global human consciousness. Because the human heart produces electromagnetic energies and even more powerful subtle energies, millions or even billions of human hearts experiencing profound emotions due to global coherence initiatives or global events will cause measurable changes in the Earth's ionosphere to appear. These changes will prove to science in the world the power of human emotions on a global and cosmic scale. Our researchers and a team that they've assembled are building what's called the Global Coherence Monitoring System. This is a system that's being made up of very sensitive sensors that measure changes in the Earth's ionosphere. The ionosphere is the Earth's protective layer around the Earth. 
And these sensors uh, can measure very subtle changes in the ionosphere. The goal is, over the next two to three years, maybe a little longer, depending on how fast the project moves, is we want to put between 50 and 100 of these sensors around the globe, have them all networked back to a central location, and be able to get a complete picture of the ionosphere 24-7. Our belief is, is that when there are large numbers of people feeling similar emotions, mass emotional output, that that could be detectable in the ionosphere. We know from other research like Dr. Roger Nelson and the Global Consciousness Project using random number generators, showing changes in these random number generators when there's strong emotionality occurring in the world, like at 9-11. There's other indicators that show that there are possible measurable changes that occur when large numbers of people are feeling something. We want to conduct experiments on uh, the effect of positive emotional states being generated by large numbers of people on the Earth itself. In a sense, sort of metaphorically, what we're attempting to do is to measure the brain waves and heart rhythms of the planet itself. By engaging our consciousness collectively into the global media and buying into the violence and the fear and all the sensationalism. Collectively, with six billion minds on the planet, we are transmitting consciousness and reinforcing that delusion. We're giving it more energy. We're telling it to maintain itself. And possibly, scientific researchers are, are finding that our consciousness is actually res cooperatively responsible for all this because consciousness is far more powerful than we can even imagine. Um, the best example I see to explain it is like the movie Catch Me If You Can where Leonardo DiCaprio hides himself around ten beautiful girls and the cops are all looking at the beautiful girls and so he gets to sneak by and that's kind of you know we're completely being distracted while these other agendas are going on and also it's you know it's putting us down constantly it's saying you know I'm better than you and um, just a lot of biasness as well and it's kind of sad that we're giving a lot of our time to watching TV and, you know, speaking as opposed to action and um, being the change out in the world. Because the, the TV is always going to, you know, report about, you know, celebrities and what's going on in Hollywood and, and news, which is, you know, only 2% of the world is really negative And they're just focusing and amplifying on that so it makes it worse than it actually is. And particularly if we know our thoughts create reality, if you have millions of people seeing these images, what's it doing to our world and our psyche on a collective level? You ask the bigger field a question and it feeds you the answer. Absolutely, absolutely. But so, the uh, uh, question should be very precise. You can't answer uh, questions, oh, what does it mean universe? Yeah. What does it mean God? It's, it will be no answer. But if you give precise question, then you will get precise answer. And then, if you operate in some area, then situation will give you what you want by itself. Through the practice of meditation, prayer, and insight, we can expand our minds and consciousness into the nine levels of the universal field of the angelic kingdoms of God. The fields contain all knowledge, all memories, and all possibilities. All we have to do is access them with our minds. They have always been there to serve humanity and the universal knowledge and presence. Science is telling us that the nine dimensional fields are perceptible to the mathematics of string theory. Science now realizes that there is a creative force in the universe that is intelligent, that it responds to our questions, it gives us creativity and insight as its intelligent answer. With these gifts that enter the mind, body and soul, we can transform our world. With this new understanding of physics and consciousness, we can revolutionize our understanding of God. We don't have to forget what we already know and what we have learned.